Hey everyone. First of all, I just want to say thanks so much for downloading this episode of the Ducast. It really means a lot, and I really appreciate that. Uh, but with this episode, please excuse the audio quality. I was experimenting with a new audio recorder, and I had unexpected results. There was a lot of uh, echoing, and our voices aren't matched up and aligned perfectly. But uh, I tried to clean up the best I could. It just wasn't perfect. So uh, just make a note. I am an amateur, and I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm just trying to figure this out as we go. So please enjoy and do it big. Hello, and welcome to the Ducast. The Ducast is a series of interviews from amazing entrepreneurs who are doing unthinkable, with topics on how they got started to where they're going and how you can learn from them. My name is Richard Hanley. I just started up a new food company about seven months ago called Hanley's Foods and a blog where I try to document all my experiences and lessons learned. With that, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Hanley's Foods, Louisiana-inspired, natural, fresh foods. There's this uh, salad dressing in Baton Rouge called Sensation. It's very popular in restaurants and cookbooks in South Louisiana. Yet, you always had to make it yourself or get it at a restaurant. You can never just buy it at the grocery store. Until now. Uh, this salad dressing, I like this salad dressing so much, I quit my day job to bring it to the market. It's made up of extra virgin olive oil, rich Italian Romano cheese, fresh squeezed lemon juice, red wine vinegar, garlic, sea salt, all that good stuff. And none of the bad. It's, uh, it's phenomenal. I call it the next ranch. <laughs> And uh, we have it in local grocery stores, only in Baton Rouge right now. And we're trying to debut uh, to New Orleans by next month. You can order it, or you can order it online at Haley'sFoods.com. And if you enter in the coupon code DUCAS at checkout, you'll get $4 off your next order. We are looking for sponsors for this podcast. However, it needs to be something that I can completely stand behind, not just pointless crap. So uh, if you don't have pointless crap and would like to get your cause, website, or product mentioned on the podcast, Drop us a line at theducast.net. So now I would love to introduce you to the guest that we have on the show. Charles Cadwell from Natchez, Mississippi. He headed out west to work in a ranch in Colorado where he was exposed to the rise of local craft beers and fell in love. Over the next few years, Charles and his childhood friend William McGee started talking and drinking a lot of beers and discussing the possibility of making their own. Now, it's a dream come true. Tin Roof is in over 450 retailers and are set to make over a million this year. The best part, only three years old. Today, I'm sitting down with Charles at his brewery in Baton Rouge to talk about his story, business and beer. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Charles Cadwell. How are you, my man? Oh, doing good. Thank you for having me, Richard. It's an honor to, uh, to be on the show. Yeah, thanks again. It, it's really great. You know, we're in this facility now, and I can just see endless piles of green from the, the next brew, which is the watermelon wheat. Watermelon wheat cans in the market right now. So it should be uh, on store shelves maybe into August, and then they'll disappear for... For another year. So is it going to be a seasonal beer too? Yeah, or? seasonal. So that's our, it's our summer seasonal. Um, and I gotta say, it's one of my favorite beers. I, I love wheat and lager type of beers, and I love that beer. So it's like a really good beer with a hint of watermelon. Yeah, it's, huh? it's really I really like great summer beer. So it'll be we'll have it up through the through the hot months in Louisiana summer, and then it'll uh, it'll be be leave the shelves until about June next year. So okay. we're excited to have it in the in the Rotation. Yeah, and I, I tried this actually about a year ago when I came into, uh, y'all had a food truck round yeah, yeah, and it was yeah. a free tour. Awesome. Y'all had it on tap. I'm like, this, this is my favorite beer. I'm like, yeah. is this going to come out? Oh. And then, yeah, yeah, I remember someone saying like a year. I'm like, oh, okay. And then, yeah, here we are, oh, a yeah. year later. We brought the cans this year. Last year we did draft only. Um, this year we, uh, we haven't been able to do draft yet because the cans have been... We haven't been able to keep up with the cans. So. Really? And I, we're, we're going to get into a little bit more of the beer later, but I, I just want to say, uh, you know, now that we're on this topic, how, how hard is it to bring something like this new to the market? Because I experienced that with, the, with our salad dressing, our strawberry vinaigrette, and uh, it's a little, lot tougher than, you, than yeah, you think. You know, for us, it's a lot about, 
it's a lot of getting the distributors to buy into the product that you're because that, you have to sell it to them first and right. then inspire them to go sell it to to the retailer so and it helps to you being a trusted brand that has you know reorders yeah, and yeah, yeah, a yeah. track record of doing well you know I think that it's uh, with, we kind of tested it on draft last year it did well so draft is a lot you know I, it's easier to take to market than, than a fully designed can that you you have to purchase 100,000 cans at a time, minimum order. So it's one of those things wow. where we didn't want to just throw it out there without having some sort of market, you know, research with it. So, right, play down. Um, but it, like you said, I mean, it, it's it takes a while. I think a lot of it's being a trusted brand mm. and uh, if people look for that next beer from their trusted from the brands that they know and that's you know. it, it I, I like i said it's my favorite beer i, I like that and the coffee porter I coffee think. porter yeah those are my two favorite beers uh, but yeah definitely love the watermelon wheat so i'll i have i had two six packs already probably well, get another one today well, i got a buddy coming in uh, appreciate the support so yeah uh so tell me back a little bit man you grew up in Mississippi, moved out to uh, Colorado yeah, to work yeah. at a ranch. What uh, was that about? So I, uh, I guess went, grew up in Natchez, was probably like an hour and 15 from here. Uh, and I went to Ole Miss, William went to LSU, where childhood friends grew up together. Uh, really didn't have any real, I guess, direction in college, didn't know what I wanted to do. So after about two years, I got on the internet and, and so like well, I, I almost went to school uh, at UC Boulder, so mm. uh, I sort of wanted to get out there and, and experience that. So I got on the internet and found a job out there on a fly fishing ranch and um, went out there. Just originally just uh, was supposed to be a summer gig and ended up staying for almost a year. So and they're just um, beautiful out there. Yeah, huh? it was awesome. It was a uh, southwest Colorado, kind of by. Uh, Durango, Telluride area, so jumped around all those places, and that's sort of, I turned 21 out there, and that's when I was yeah, first right. introduced to New Belgium beers, and, wow. you know, that was uh, nine years ago, so they were, uh, they were big, but they weren't as big as they are now, so it was, you And know, they just got into Louisiana, like, yeah, just, uh, a few months ago, ago. Okay, yeah. a month ago, yeah, yeah. so... So yeah, you started testing some beers out there, and when was it that, uh, so what happened, what happened from there? So you were exposed to all these beers, I guess them out. I used to work at a, also used to work at a barbecue restaurant in Natchez, and uh, we always had people coming in saying, you know, what's your local beer, what's your local beer? And this is nine years ago in the South, the craft beer movement was uh, very much, I would say, in its infancy, you know, not... Uh, didn't have all the things we, you know, now we've got seven breweries in Louisiana, operating breweries, so it's, uh, people would always come in and say that, and back then, all, you know, we didn't really have anything, um, and that was even in Natchez, so I, I realized there was a demand for it in other areas of the country, because Natchez is a big tourist town, people mm -hmm. coming to see all the Annabelle homes, um, and then when I went out to Colorado, I was really saw it out there, I was like, okay, well, the South is so passionate. We're always five years behind. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, the, the, like with the food, I mean, right. Louisiana cuisine, it's it's just makes us like, how come this hasn't caught on for beer? Like, why? So that's sort of how it got, it was born. And then uh, ended up in banking, I guess in, in, in banking long enough to know that. that that's I, not what you want. <laughs> it was sort of one of those things where it was, and William and I were talking kind of the whole time. Uh, and it was like, okay, we either have to do this or quit talking about it because, you know, if, if we... If and just to paint the picture, too, yeah, you were a banker, you were a lawyer or in school at in the time. In law school at the time, yeah. So it was one of the... And we just, uh, I mean, we talked about it every day, worked on it every day, and it got to the point where we had so much work in it. It was like, okay, well, we either What's have next? to bail on this and just go live our lives or you know, take the next step right. and really do it. And so we both, I think the, the tipping point was, was like, okay, well, 20 years from now, 
I'm going to be kicking myself if someone else did it and I'm just going to be sitting there saying, yeah, Wayman and I almost did that. Are you going to sit here and wait for yeah. that to happen? Right. So that, that was kind of how it, uh, how it got started and how we got that last push. And then after that, it was still lots of, lots of work and lots of planning. So were, were you still, so now you made it a commitment to make it start. How did, how did you start making it official? Um, as far as getting financing and make it, going you to make a few batches first and yeah, testing so out with family and friends. I mean, we started with knew what we wanted to do. Um, the main thing we started putting together a business plan, um, looking at the numbers, trying to figure out if it was a uh, viable business option. What we're um, Going back and forth with family, starting drawing logos, coming up with names. Stuff How did like you that. come up with the name, by the way? The name was the. That's always. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we. It fits. The, this place is great. It has this rustic, uh, just southern feel. That's kind of what we wanted. We wanted it to be. I didn't want to pigeonhole to Baton Rouge Brewing Company, you know, because I knew there were some other big, big markets out there that, that we really wanted. Um, and our goal is to be eventually, you know, a regional craft brewery is what we want to be. So it's like, okay, well, what is something everybody can relate to? Um, we wanted a handcrafted, uh, you know, we really wanted to evoke some feeling from the name, and that that was what we came up with. It's Ten Root, as far as a deep south um, icon, sort you know, so to speak, as as everybody can relate to, either whether it's a fishing camp, whether it's a, right. you know, but it's uh, eating and drinking with, with friends and family and, and that sort of feel, so. Yeah, and it, I think it's a great overall brand to have the tagline, go local, spelt the Louisiana way, G-A-U-X. Yeah, yeah. And so that's, uh, that's sort of what we were going for, and, and, it's, and it's worked for us so far, so fingers crossed. Yeah. Knock on wood. A million this year, that's great. So you have a few batches tested out. You're in, you're in the garage. Y'all have all that going. Mm -hmm. I see some jugs. You look like uh, yeah, garage material here. Yeah, yeah. So, so how, do, how do you go from there to, to the next, this space? A lot of research and trying to, and the, the thing about the craft beer industry, everybody's willing to help, but at the same time, it's not something that everyone knows about. So, you know, it, it's such a, uh, God, it's a complicated endeavor. There's, there are things that we can research and research and research and could have researched for another 10 years and you still don't know until you right. do it. Like for example, I have a, a buddy of mine who's asking the question, you know, where do you find like the barley and the hops and the wheat and the rye or whatever goes in your beer, how do you find that? Because there's not, like me, I'm, you know, I have access to Sam's and Restaurant Depot and yeah, you know, yeah, these yeah, other yeah. kind of big box uh, type of stores for, for my ingredients, but for alcohol and beer making, is there yeah. like the, I've so, heard of Mid-South uh, Mid Industries, uh, I think they cater to beer, local so beer. We have, uh, there's like a Mid-Country Mall. Okay. Um, we have, uh, basically you just find there's, Big malt houses, malt suppliers, hop suppliers, hop farms, and it's just sourcing those ingredients. And, and one of the really difficult aspects of our industry is it's growing so much, mm. and the, there's such a craft beer um, explosion that there's uh, ingredients are tight, especially on the hop side. It's being able to you have to contract your hops. You know, when we started, we didn't have any hop contracts. Um, so we're lucky to have what we had now. We contract the hops for the next year. I mean, you we got contracts three years from now that you're trying to forecast your growth and just hmm. to, so you'll have your. So with, with these companies, you have to uh, tell them, "Hey, look, we're planning to order you know 20 barrels of hops this for, for the next 20 months or something." Is so that like a contract? Like we'll, they'll do it by the crop year. Okay. So like 2013 crop will be the 2014 brew year, and I will contract like. Let's say I contract a thousand pounds of a specific hop. So it's kind of like so, pre-order it. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, that I have to. Uh, I've committed to those that thousand pounds, and at a certain point in the year, they're gonna. Uh, the hop supplier is gonna say, "Okay, you've still got 900 pounds on your commitment. Mm -hmm. You need to, uh, you know, 
we got to you got to pay for them and we'll send them to you. So it's kind of like that. So it's hard really forecasting for what you could need. You, could you then use that for the, like the next year though? Yeah, you could. You use it? Uh, just depends on. You could, uh, the good th you could sell them to other breweries, which is always uh, that's a good thing about the industry. People are always needing hops, um, right. but it makes certain it's difficult. Certain varieties are almost impossible to get. So, um, so for, for like the uh, for the guy in the garage uh, to get hops, is that even possible, or you have to go, better better yeah, odds I mean, growing it, it or something? Like the, the guy in the garage there, um, like homebrew supply shops like Austin. Uh, homebrew and, and lots of those places. Uh, those places have hop contracts with the big hop farms that we do. So, right, but they'll that's where cater to, yeah. the, to the little guys. So they'll take a big 44 pound box of hops and repackage it for a homebrewer. Right. So y'all have y'all, did y'all start off with one recipe or did y'all have a whole line? Well, we, well, the, the recipe development has come a long way. It's, it's really, uh, we started off with, originally we wanted to do two beers. We ended up doing, well, originally we wanted to do three beers. We ended up doing two, the Voodoo Bengal and the Perfect, Perfect. Ten Amber. Right. Um, and then we added the Blonde. Um, Bring it to LSU. Yeah, yeah. Kind of. That was, that's, you know, talks of that going on and, and um, that that's how the blonde was born. We really weren't even going to brew that beer, but they came to us, and it was an you know, LSU. Yeah, wow. it was a because uh, yeah, I mean LSU, LSU Tigers. I mean they are very passionate about LSU merchandise, and yeah. if people can walk around with the local beer that's oh, purple yeah. and gold, it will fly off the shelves. So it was originally there was some talks of a uh, brewing science stuff associated with the uh, with. LSU, and that's how that, that idea was born. And, and so we, Tom, our brewmaster, started working on the blonde, um, and it just kind of it took off once we once we made it and put it out there. So, so yeah, right. And y'all just market that to LSU. Did they help y'all with that? Like, put I mean, really for sponsor us, sponsor or something or no? We we kind of I mean, originally the can design and everything it was all. It was supposed to be an association between the two, almost like a, uh, but all that fell through for various okay. medical. Um, so we just went, we're like, okay, well, we've got this, this beer that we developed and we've got this can design that we developed, so just, you Yeah, know. it's a good tasting beer too, yeah. so it's not just targeted directly yeah. here, it's just, and like how it's not, it doesn't say anything about LSU Tigers, it's just yeah. purple and gold, it's gone blonde. And it's, so uh, it could still move elsewhere, it's not yeah. geared directly to one town. One thing for us too, I think it, it's almost Baton Rouge, is when people think Baton Rouge, people think, you know, purple and gold. Everything mm -hmm. in this town is purple and gold. It's a college so, town. Yeah, it kind of says, sure. um, it says that it, it, it's, it's a piece of Baton Rouge too. Yeah, so, it's the colors of Baton Rouge. Yeah, so. Um, okay, so now that you, right, you have your two beers, uh, you're in the home garage, you got the business plan, and the last chapter of the business plan is the financials. How did you raise the money to kickstart it? Did, were you, where, did you jump into this facility? Where'd you go from there? Lots of, lots of uh, convincing from uh, family members, with family members, and also uh, with my banking background, some uh, bank financing, and basically, that's pretty much how that so came together. It's a so, smaller type of loan, and yeah, yeah. just borrowing from a yeah, lot of friends. Yeah, borrowing from friends and family, and and what did that get y'all? Did that get y'all here? Or? Yeah, that got us here. Wow, um, it got us. It's a great location. It's you know, the heart of uh, Baton Rouge. We're right in between LSU and downtown Baton Rouge. Yeah, well, I love this location. I love this area. I think it's coming along. I think it's really gonna. You got a nice little property out there for people to do events yeah. and come in. And I think it's gonna. It's come a long way. And I think this area is just getting better. But uh, so that got us here, you know, with the commercial system and, and lots of other, you know, a couple tanks and some stuff like that. But a lot of, uh, we didn't have the canning line. We didn't have. So y'all were just making kegs at that time? Yeah, were they just cool? draft only. So, yeah, we have our, our, that's been expanded since then. But that cooler used to oh, be yeah. a lot smaller. Um, so it was just, uh, 
reinvesting back in the business over the past three years to add more fermentation, more uh, you know canning line, more kegs, more everything. And I see too from the video online, which I'll link to that on on, uh, on the show notes. That I mean, you guys, yeah, you might have the equipment for the canning and the capping, but it's still very hands on. You guys are operating oh, the forklifts, yeah, yeah, putting yeah. the little uh, the rubber seals on the on the six yeah. pack. It's uh, it's very so still hands on, hands-on, so even though y'all y'all look like a great big company and y'all are, but yeah, it still has a lot of There's you know hard hard work associated with it. The, right? the most automation on this is, and then this facility is is, is on the canning line. And the canning line is uh, still one person loading cans and one person making six packs and building pallets. So it's curious still- because right now I fill one at a time, and I was just told about another place that fills ten at a time, and that just makes what I'm doing look bad. <laughs> How many are y'all filling at a time? Um, Five at a time. Okay. So we do. And loads it from the bottom up. Is that how it works? Yeah. Okay. So we uh, it's about thirty cans a minute. Running, wow. running past, so. so on a on a full production day, how many could y'all pump out? Do about thirty barrels in seven hours, so that's four hundred cases roughly. Wow. Uh, so, but it's still uh, canning's a long, long day, long. Right. Long so process. next step to, to to get it in the can and to get the facility obviously comes the distributor. Mm-hmm. How, how, how were those relationships like to, uh, did you all fly out and go pitch the distributors? Well, the good thing is the, a lot of the distributors are hungry for the local, local craft brands. So, right. And the, the landscape of uh, beer and craft beer of the past, uh, really in, in Louisiana over the last three or four or five years has really changed. So the, the distributors are, are looking for good uh, viable brands that, that they can that they feel will be strong out in the market. So, and then once you get in there, you still have to head on out to a lot of those other yeah, mom I mean, and pop shops, and, and then go. Still pitch a it. lot of. I mean, have the distributor. That's, that's the, kind of where I'm at now. I'm, I'm trying to talk to a distributor, and we're in a good bit of stores. And I'm realizing, you know, I, I love to get out there and tell people about it. I I could sell this mm-hmm. stuff all day long, but I can't physically be everywhere. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. obviously, you have to have sales reps. How do y'all go about uh, training those guys? Y'all first, you have to put in your work. So then. Uh, you have like policy or something, or just so John and John uh, were both uh, friends of ours that that had been in the industry in some form or fashion. He's been around for a while. So how you guys did it? Yeah, John Peak uh, managed bars and restaurants, uh, and he was really I guess inspired by the brand, looking to do something be a part of it. Um, John Smith, the same thing. John Smith was actually was a um, on-premise salesman for a distributor, so he knew the beer and mm. beer business answer, as well. Right. I mean, you got to find people that are passionate. Yeah. So it's just about who who it speaks to and who wants to be a part of something. So. Right. Um, so when when doing all that, looking back where you are now, three years ago, what do you think was the hardest single thing that you've got that, that you faced so far? The hardest single thing that we like distributing, raising about. money, uh, finding staff, finding the right people, I mean, probably making the perfect recipe, something exploding. Having a good team and balancing growth, and I don't know. It's hard to say, really. It's because yeah, you, you can only grow as fast as your sales. So yeah. I understand that's hard because, for example, like with me, I can uh, like I get my glass from New Jersey, so I have to sell my batch to get cash to order my glass. It takes yeah. two weeks before I can make my next pass. So it's a cash flow, you know, it you can only go so fast. So I mean, it's difficult, right. you know, and uh, it's, uh, that's kind of, I would say, that's been the most difficult in ma- managing the logistics of production and, and trying to keep up with production and it becomes, uh, I don't know, there's lots of ins and outs and what have you that, uh, it, it, and people don't realize, you know, yeah. that beer, a beer operation like this is more than just, you know, let's go make some beer today, you know. And this is hard. I couldn't imagine getting this thing permanent because I know how the DHH is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the facility I go to and I'm running a kitchen. So how do you, how do you make your uh, sanitation and just facility foolproof? Y'all have like For a checklist? Us, everything is 
sanitation is is key on the brewing side because it's also it's all, everything's Bacteria, basically right. closed yeast. enclosed tanks and if there's anything in those tanks that uh, your beer's going to be infected so and if your beer's infected you're going to get all flavors and you get all flavors nobody's going to buy your beer so it kind of takes care it's of it's got to be hard to make like, the same thing over and over every time yeah, and consistency is, is huge in our business too right. like the uh, the consistency is people want to go out and buy the same product that's the product they had the last time you know, every single time. Right. So, it's uh, definitely a challenge, but it's, that's, sanitation is priority number one around here, especially on the brew house side and the seller side. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, what is it that, uh, what's, what's the goal for, how's it going? What's the goal for, uh, for Tin Roof as a company, where you see yourself in like five years from now? Um, Ten years, twenty. I don't know, but you know, larger regional brewery, multiple states, distribute, you know, um, new facility or state of the art facility. Um, are y'all just in? Are y'all where y'all? Are y'all nationwide now, or just, just Louisiana? South? Louis- okay. Yeah. Um, so, just Louisiana. Um, one market in Mississippi, Natchez. Mm-hmm. Um, Gotta go to the hometown, man. The hometown, and we hope to have Jackson South in Mississippi by you know next year. So that's our goal. Cool. But, so all beer aside, what do you what do you like to do outside uh, outside, outside the the beer life? Um, Test new beers. Beer, or? yeah. <laughs> beer is always a major part right. of it. Um, fish. Hunt, be outdoors, uh, hang out with friends and family, and but I mean it's always trying new beers, you know, searching out new beers, visiting breweries if I'm going somewhere, you know, right. I want to go see, want to go to a beer store. And, but you and, love going to towns, new towns, yeah, small and towns, and checking and stuff out, and finding where the brew pub or the brewery is or whatnot. So yeah, that is pretty kinda, cool. So I want to ask you too. It's one thing I ask everyone is, uh, what's a book? A song and a quote you love. Hmm. Book. I really like uh, "Boy's Life" by Robert McCammon. I think is his last name. It's really just a uh, really imaginative. Um, mm. It reminds me of. It's written from the uh, viewpoint of a. 13 year old kid and it's just puts you in that mindset and I think it's easy to lose a lot of that so I, I read the book over and over like, yeah I, I, I learned that from my kids is you know they always ask why for everything and that's like you know as, as you're become as you're a grown up sort of say quote unquote I'm going to get my fingers up is that you just learn to do what you're supposed yeah. to and it's easy to a lose kid that. just questions everything mm-hmm. and as an adult you need to do the same thing yeah. question everything and then uh, what's that song a song, uh, right, and a quote. Old Crow Medicine Show, Wagon Wheel, probably. Um, it's just, God, just I've always liked that yeah. song. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the Darius version, but uh, I'm trying to think. And it, Wait So Long by Trampled by Turtles, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. And quote... Um, Come on, I'm sure you've done your fair share of toasts. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I tried to think. My favorite quote would probably... Um, I can't answer that one. I, <laughs> I caught you off guard. Um, you have to email me one later and I can yeah. put it up on there. Maybe you can uh, find one. Better to be... Silent and appear dumb than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Yeah? Okay. So I like that one. Cool um, man. Hey, so uh what's next for you guys? I know you got the watermelon wheat and all that, so what's next for you and, and Tin Roof? Um and where can people find you? Next is we we're just adding we added six thousand square feet back there to our facility, so all these cans and everything are gonna be moved back there. Mm-hmm. Looking at new brew house, more fermentation space, um, maybe another cooler. Just trying to basically the real infrastructure of this business improve, become more efficient, 
so we can grow, uh, so we can expand territory and grow our brands and our, our brand, current tin roof as a whole uh, in Louisiana and, and Mississippi. Right. So that's kind of the, force, you know, just the near future. Cool. Lots of equipment upgrades. Yeah, expanding um, that production and just yeah. getting bigger and bigger. That's what you gotta do is, uh, you know, grow organically. I learned that you can't because at first I just wanted to get into the co-packing and have the distributor call it co-packer, and I just kind of you know sit back. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, but no, yeah. you just you have to grow. The, if you want to do it right, you just got to grow organically. And you know, as your cash flow builds, that's when you can buy new equipment and expand your production into new areas. When do you plan, plan, do you plan to uh, get into those other southern states like yeah, Florida, Texas, Mississippi, where well, you're in Mississippi, Alabama? For us, it'll be Mississippi, and then it's going to be, you know, I don't know what we're going to do with as far as Texas or go further east because Louisiana, especially Louisiana products, it's a, there's a big following in Texas mm -hmm. for Louisiana. Um, Products, so I, I don't know what we're gonna gonna do there or how it's gonna. How, how do you normally tackle that? A new town? Do you just uh, get the distributor lined up and hop in the car, or get your sales guys out there and start get the bar by bar, beer by beer? Yeah, pretty much. It? I mean, grassroots. Yeah. Get the distributor out there and then just kind of do your market research before you go to the market, but then go out there and hit it and try to you know have some goals set for what you want to do in that particular market. Because some, I mean, not everywhere is going to be. Um, you know, a Baton Rouge or New Orleans, you right. know, you have to uh, temper expectations, but it, it's definitely, you want to succeed everywhere. So you, you look at each market, figure out, okay, what can we expect from this market? What, what, and then just go and try to, try to hit your goals. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of build on your strengths and try to eliminate what you don't think is going to work ahead of time. So yeah. you won't be caught off guard. Cool, man. Well, uh, dude, thanks so much for being on the show. Where can people find you? Just tinroof.com? Yeah, tinroofbeer.com. Okay. Yeah, tinroofbeer.com or uh, tinroofbeer, Facebook. Okay, and Twitter too? Yeah, Twitter, tinroofbeer, cool. at tinroofbeer. Well, you can find this interview online as well as topics, quotes, and links at thedocast.net. I'd like to thank our sponsor too, Hanley's Foods. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and uh, leave a five-star review if you could. That'd be nice. It definitely helps the show. This is Richard and Charles signing out. Thanks for having me. Do it big. Thank you.